This video is part of a first course in modelling analysis and control and now we're going to look at an introduction to second order system responses. So this video looks at systems for which the resulting model reduces to a second order differential equation and you can see we've given a typical second order differential equation here. So examples might be a mass spring damper or an RLC circuit. In fact, in this module, the second order models or examples you come across are more likely to arise due to feedback rather than first principles modelling. Core skills then. How do you derive and sketch the response of a second order system? Do you understand core terms such as damping ratio, natural frequency, overshoot, decay rate? What do we mean by overdamped and underdamped? And what's the impact of damping on behaviour such as oscillation, overshoot, decay? and settling time. Now a key point here is the focus of this brief video is on, you can see here, underdamped responses. That's our focus. Because cases with overdamped responses are largely straightforward, not that different from first order systems in fact, and covered in videos on Laplace, inverse Laplace and behaviours. The general form for second order systems then. The community represents ODEs with a conventional format where complex routes or underdamping are expected. And this format is widely used in all the textbooks and is important for control topics. So you can see I've given a generic second order ODE here with coefficients A, B, C and D. But what the community would rather you use is this form here. You can see I've written d2x dt squared plus 2 zeta omega n dx dt plus omega n squared x equals k times u. So this is the general form that's expected for underdamped responses. Now, the system is underdamped if zeta is less than 1. And you can see this zeta term appears in the second coefficient there. The system is underdamped if the characteristic equation has complex roots. So in fact, those two statements are equivalent, um, as you will see as we go on. Damping definitions then. So the damping ratio is the parameter that determines the general form of the response. Now, if we look at the characteristic equation down here, okay, and we find the roots, you'll see the roots are given here and you'll notice that this damping ratio appears in the roots. Now the key point is you have complex roots if the damping ratio is less than one and you can see that because this term here in the square root will be negative if zeta is less than one so you'll end up with complex roots. So what do we get? If zeta is bigger than one you have real roots, you have an overdamped system and no oscillations. If zeta equals 1, you have a critically damped system and no oscillations. And if zeta is less than 1, you have an underdamped system with complex roots and you will have oscillation. And this is the case that this video is going to focus on. So an illustration of the impact of damping. And you can see here what we've done is we've changed this damping ratio to have four different values and looked at how the response varies. So you can see with a damping of 0.75, We've got this red curve, minimal, you probably don't even notice it, oscillation. If I take the damping to 0.5, this blue curve, you can see now I've got a bit of oscillation. If I take the damping all the way down to 0.1, you can see I've got a lot of oscillation and a much slower convergence. So the decay slows down as the damping decreases and you get more oscillation. And we want to unpick that in a bit more detail. So for an underdamped system, find the solution with constant input and zero initial conditions and a steady state of one. You'll notice I've deliberately set the right hand side to be omega n squared here. So we get a steady state of one. So the response is normalized in some sense. Now, this is actually book work or something you might do in a maths module. So we're not going to derive it here, but we're going to give you the core result. So you can look it up if you need it. And here you'll see there's two terms. There's an exponential term here, which gives you the decay rate. So basically, how fast do you converge? And then there's a sinusoidal term, and you'll notice it's got this frequency here, omega d, which tells you how fast you oscillate. <laughs> 
So let's summarize the key values. The peak overshoot is given by this formula here, e to the minus zeta pi over the square root of one minus zeta squared. The decay rate per peak, you'll see actually these are pretty much the same formula, except that there's a two in there. Okay, so peak overshoot time. In essence, this is actually half the oscillation period. Okay, and you'll see there's a nice formula here, which depends upon omega n, the natural frequency, and zeta, the damping ratio. And there's the solution again. So sketching second order responses. So what are the key points if you want to do a sketch? We're going to assume zero initial conditions. Next, we find the steady state. Then we calculate the damping ratio. And from the damping ratio, we can get the peak overshoot or decay rate. Now, if I go back, you'll see that there's the peak overshoot there's the decay rate and you see both those formula depend solely on the damping and then we're going to get the peak overshoot time and that formula you're reminded is down here which tells you where the peaks and troughs occur now key point sketching is used to characterize the general behavior so the key word here is to characterize the general behavior and hence we're using zero initial conditions and fixing the times of the peaks and the troughs as any other assumptions would be too messy. Here's an example. Sketch the unit step response of the following system assuming zero initial conditions. So first I can find the steady state is 1 over 6. You can see that from using 6x equals 1 at steady state. The initial gradient is 0. That's given we've got zero initial conditions. The natural frequency is omega n equals root 6. And you can see that because if I write in my normalized form x double dot plus 2 zeta omega n x dot plus omega n squared x equals 1, you can see that omega n squared is 6. So next, I use this formula, 2 zeta omega n equals 2. And I use that to solve for zeta, which is 1 over root 6. The peak overshoot time, I just plug these numbers into the formula. So I've got zeta, I've got omega n, I just plug them into the formula and I get an answer of 1.4. And then finally, I calculate the overshoot using that overshoot formula and I find the overshoot is 25%. So now I've got all the data I need to do a sketch. So here's the sketch, but we'll show you the points one at a time. First, I note that I've got zero gradient at time zero, and you can just about tell that from the graph. The steady state is 1 over 6. You can see that this value here is about 0.167. The peak time was 1.4, so I mark that there. And if you wanted to, you could put a vertical line because that tells you where the first peak is going to occur. Now, the second peak is going to be, or trough in this case, is going to be twice that, so it's going to be at 2.8. So again, if you want, you could put that there and mark where the trough is going to occur. The first overshoot was 25%. So basically, you've got to work that out as a number, but that's 25% of the steady state. The second undershoot is going to be 25% squared. So you can see I've got 1 over 6 times 0.25 squared. So get your calculator out if you need to, but to be honest, it's probably not worth it. So having got these key points, okay, now all you do is draw a smooth sketch between them. Now the key point is obviously I've done a neat graph, but in practice you do this on the back of envelope. You're just trying to capture roughly how is this system behaving. Characterizing second order responses. The natural frequency, omega n, impacts on the poles and behaviors as a limiting factor. You'll notice here I've reminded you what the roots are given as from the characteristic equation. You've got minus zeta omega n plus or minus omega n times the square root of zeta squared minus 1, and we're taking zeta to be less than 1, so we've got complex roots. So therefore, this bit here the minus zeta omega n is the real part. So that tells us about the decay rate. That's the bit that's going to go into the exponential. So the implied time constant is 1 over zeta omega n. So what you can see is the fastest possible time constant is going to be when zeta equals 1. 
which gives you 1 over omega n. And if zeta is less than 1, the time constant is going to be larger, so you're going to converge slower. So that's a key insight here, that if zeta gets smaller, the decay gets slower. OK, so as zeta approaches 0, the decay gets very slow, the time constant gets very large, and that's not acceptable. Let's look at the imaginary part then. So that tells us the frequency of oscillation. And what you'll see is here we get the reverse result. So omega n is now the upper limit, because if zeta equals 0, then essentially you get omega n times 1. So that's the, the largest frequency you can get. But as zeta approaches 1, the square root of zeta squared minus 1 gets to be a smaller and smaller number, and so your frequency gets slower and slower. So as zeta approaches 1, the oscillation gets very slow. Now, overshoot is also important. The overshoot basically is determined by this formula here. So we can easily plot a graph of the overshoot against the damping ratio. Now you notice the maximum possible overshoot is 100% because that corresponds to pure oscillation. So you've got a pure sinusoid. And the minimum overshoot when the damping gets to 1 is 0. Now, interestingly, you'll notice that this number is totally independent of the natural frequency omega n. The other thing you'll notice if you read the textbooks is often people choose a value of about 0.7. Now, why are they doing that? Because if you choose 0.7, you can see that the overshoot is going to be around 5%. And so the argument is that 5% overshoot is often relatively insignificant, not important. So anything above 0.7 is taken to be acceptable. Now here's the key thing to emphasize that the natural frequency doesn't come into the overshoot. You'll see I've got two very different systems, but they've got the same damping ratio. And what you notice, they've got the same peak overshoot. So the peak overshoot depends solely on the damping ratio. And here, a graph to demonstrate the um, significance of this damping ratio of about 0.7. You can see with the 0.7, this picture here, yes, there is a bit of overshoot, not huge, a bit of overshoot, but not lots. The decay rate is pretty much the same as a critically damp system, which has zeta equals 1. But the nice thing of having slight underdamping is you've actually got faster transients. You can see here we're faster to get to 1. So this is why people often say, I'd rather have a damping ratio of 0.7 than perhaps a damping ratio of 1. Some conclusions then. So this video has briefly introduced insights into the behaviour of underdamped second order models and the core parameter definitions of natural frequency and damping ratio. The formula characterising the response are given, but we haven't derived them. The derivations are straightforward but tedious, and they're in the longer notes, which clearly you will need to look at to understand this topic more carefully. And the general guidance is the jumping ratio should be higher than 0.7, because otherwise there's too much oscillation and convergence may also be too slow. And a final reminder, obviously keep up with the quizzes and tutorial sheets, bring questions to contact sessions, and do look at the slow resources which will go through this material a lot more carefully and meticulously.